So Emerson said in our meditation reading, the person will worship something, that what you are worshiping, you are becoming. So we're going to talk about what you might be worshiping inside, what you might be becoming. Because what you, what you believe about life shapes what you think, and what you think shapes how you act, and your actions shape your whole life and the world. So your thoughts and your belief about the world, those are very core questions to examine when you're thinking about what you want your life to be like and how you want to affect the world. And the Buddha taught that there are thoughts which lead to happiness and thoughts, thoughts which lead to pain. And the thoughts leading to happiness are thoughts of um, kindness and contentment and goodwill and non-harming. And the thoughts which lead to pain are craving, desire, grasping, greed, resentment, grumbling, thoughts of violence. He said, when people think the one kind of thought, then happiness follows you like your shadow, which is wherever you are, there it is. And if you think the other kind of thoughts, then pain follows you like a big old wooden cart follows an ox that's pulling it. So we are invited by the Buddha to look at our lives and think, do I have happiness uh, shadowing me or uh, do I have a giant trail of messed up situations lumbering behind me like a cart with a wobbly wheels. So what we talked about last month was the first strand of the eightfold path. It's not really an eight step path. It has eight elements that uh, mingle and mix together and you kind of do them. They're all related to each other. Uh, but the first one is pretty foundational. It's called right understanding, right view. And that's your view of the universe. And what the Buddha said, uh, his view of the universe was, and what Buddhism's view of the universe is, is that um, the truth of the universe is that life is suffering. There's, life is out of joint. Dukkha is the word in Pali that they use. Um, dukkha is just like your, like your shoulders out of place. And so there's, there's pain, there's suffering, things aren't right. Now, the reason things aren't right is because of desire and craving. That we're always scared that our, our money's going to go, or our relationship's going to go, or our body's going to go. We're scared, or we want a better job, we want a better car, we want a better um, situation altogether. We, just, we want our children to be a certain way, and we want our parents to behave a certain way, and, and we'd like for ourselves to behave a certain way, and we... Anyway, you know the situation. <laughs> Craving causes fear and discontent. And the way that you can get rid of a lot of suffering is by letting go of your craving. That's the third noble truth. Life is suffering. Suffering is because of desire. You let go of desire, that lets go of a lot of your suffering. Uh, and the fourth noble truth is the way that you do all that is by the Eightfold Path. Okay, so interestingly enough, it's okay to want freedom from suffering. Buddhism doesn't teach you can't want anything. It just assumes that people want to be happy and they want to be free from suffering. They just go about it the wrong way, and by they I mean we. So... Um, it's not that Buddhism says don't want anything because you can certainly aim for freedom from suffering. It's just here's the Buddha's teaching about how to get there. The Buddha um, invites you to have three intentions that guide your life, and I'll tell you about those in a minute. But first I want to go back to Emerson, who said that we already have intentions. We don't even know what they are sometimes. And it behoove us to realize what that strand at the core of the wand of our being is and what uh, it's, how it's affecting us. 
Now, are we the people who are, do we find that we want most of all to be safe so we don't take a lot of risks and we try to hoard um, money or things or whatever people hoard? Um, I have the opposite problem. I just don't like holding on to things, which doesn't make me a better person. Um, do you want to be respected above all else? Do you want to be successful? Do you want, do you want to be uh, admired? Do you want to be the smartest person in the room? Do you want to be the person that everybody turns to and says, oh, what do you think? And then they all listen while you talk. Do you want that? What is it that you want? That's what's guiding your life. One time when I had a much smaller congregation, I gave everybody a paper plate underneath their seat. <laughs> And I asked them to make a compass out of it and put a word on each compass point, a word, a, a concept that guided their steering. And one lady came up to me afterwards and said, Meg, we, d we don't want to find things under our seats. <laughs> and could you please stop being funny? <laughs> I know. I said, I'm really sorry. I, I can't help it. So what would you steer by? If you had words that you were going to put on your compass, would, would joy be there? Would contentment be there? Would uh, kindness be there? What are the things that are already guiding you? Um, there's a writer named Martha Beck who wrote many books about this same thing. She kind of writes the same book over and over, but this one is called Steering by Starlight. Um, and she says that to find your real desire... What you do is you ask yourself questions about what you think you want. So she has a client who says, I just want my business to be successful. I'll do anything to make my business successful. And she says, ask yourself, what then? If your business is successful, what then? Well, then I would feel like I had my self-respect and other people would respect me. Well, what then? Well, then my dad would be proud of me and he would say he was proud of me. And well, what then? Well, then I wouldn't feel like such a failure. And then she asks her client to consider uh, that perhaps a feeling of failure is internal and not external. And perhaps a way to stop feeling like a failure is to deal with what's in here rather than to make stuff happen out here. Or she had a client, she's a, a life coach, which she makes fun of that term all the time. Um, she always has to go, I have two, two PhDs from Harvard. <laughs> but I, <laughs> anyway, she's a funny woman. And... Um, she says, I have a client who says, I just want a baby. I just want to have a baby. And then she says, okay, so you have a baby. What then? Well, then I would feel loved. And so she asks her client, might there be another way to feel loved? Might a feeling of being loved be in here? And might it be good to maybe take care of that before you have the baby? Because to saddle a kid with the job of filling the hole in an adult is really too big a job for a kid. Uh, there is a business writer named Susie Welch. She had a demanding job. She had kids. She had a marriage. Um, she came up with a decision-making system that she calls 10-10-10. And um, I was so interested in that, I decided, you know, at the beginning of the month that I was going to preach on this because, you know, I wanted to learn about it. And... <sighs> I'll tell you, I'll tell you about it. So 10, 10, 10, but I'll tell you about my difficulties with it because I just can't make anything simple. So um, 10, 10, 10 is a way of making a decision. You ask yourself, if I make this decision, what will it feel like in 10 minutes, in 10 months, in 10 years? She says she's at work and her boss says, Susie, I need you to, I need you to run this meeting on Saturday. And she knows that if she runs the meeting, it'll be a good check mark in her box toward the promotion that might be coming. Yet, she's promised her son that she'll go to his black belt test. And she applies 10, 10, 10. And she says, okay, in 10 minutes, if I tell my boss no, my boss will be disappointed, but my son will be ecstatic. In 10 months, my son will have a good 
solid sense of me being part of the important moments of his life. And I will have 10 months to make my boss proud of me. And in 10 years, uh, my son will you know, maybe look for someone who, who puts him first and who gives him the love that he deserves, and he'll be a confident guy. And so she decided to give up the meeting. And I think, because I'm Unitarian and therefore contrarian, <laughs> you know it's true. I think, or your son will have no idea what you gave up in order to be at his thing. He'll be happy that you're at his thing, but he doesn't know what it costs you. Never will. Can't imagine it from here. So you'll be at his thing, and your boss will be disappointed. Okay, 10 minutes. 10 months, you may be looking at the back of somebody else who's got the job that you wanted. And how's that going to be? every day because you know they're going to promote somebody who's an idiot and can't do the job like you. <laughs> and then in 10 years, you've had plenty of time to let your son know you love him and maybe he'll be seeking a partner who doesn't put him first all the time and he won't be a narcissistic jerk who thinks everything should revolve around him. <laughs> so 10, 10, 10 totally wouldn't work for me in that situation, I would think. What kind of a person do I want to be in this moment? But I think 10, 10, 10 does work in other situations like, do I want to go to the gym or take a nap? <laughs> Which is a decision I make every day. <laughs> and I think, OK, if I go to the gym instead of taking a nap, I will feel virtuous and I will wish I was asleep, but I will feel good, and then I'll get in the pool, and it'll be wonderful, and in 10 months, I'll be stronger, and the gym will be a habit for me. Um, I, have, I have a friend who calls it the James. She says, I don't go often enough to call him Jim. <laughs> okay. I know, you would like her. She's going to be a UU minister one day. Um, so anyway, so 10 months, the gym is a habit, and you're feeling stronger, and you're moving better. And in 10 years, you make that decision every day. You're not even, it's not even going to be a decision anymore. You'll feel wrong if you don't go. So I think, OK, that's what I'm going for. So I go to the gym. Or you think, um, I have a friend who has to decide every night, do I want to drink myself to sleep? And so 10, 10, 10 for her would be, you know, in 10 minutes, if I drink, I'll feel great. I'll start relaxing, and the high keening of the day will start going away. But then in 10 months, I'm going to feel sick, and I'm going to have a sense of having done myself damage. And in 10 years, um, if I do this every night, I'm just going to basically be a drunk. And so what do I want? But she makes that decision over again every single day. And right now she's going, I'll drink myself to sleep tomorrow, <laughs> not tonight. So 10, 10, 10 invites you to think things all the way through to where do you want to be in 10 years? And you can think, oh, it's just today. It's just one day. I'll start tomorrow. I'll make the decisions tomorrow that'll make me in 10 years the person I'd like to be. I'll make my life the life I'd like to have in 10 years. But you know, every year is made up of just one days. And, um, <laughs> You, uh, every time I do a wedding, I say to the congregation, you know your relationships are the product of at least 10 tiny decisions that you make every day. You make little tiny decisions every day, and that is what builds your relationship. And so wherever it is, it is the product of those tiny little everyday decisions where you think, oh, it's just a day. You know, I'm, I'm just, I'm not going to say sorry first because I'm tired of doing that. <laughs> or I'm not going to offer the first foot rub, or I'm not going to, whatever little decisions you make every day. I'm busy. I'm not going to look up when they come in the room and smile at them. I'm busy. Little tiny decisions are what make your life. They're what make 10 years from now. So I think it's good to invite people um, to think things all the way through. And so 
um, that makes you become acquainted with your core value because you have to think what's important to you, where do you want to go? And um, so the Buddha said these three intentions are important. I'm going to tell you what they are now. One is renouncing desire. Your intention to renounce desire, renounce craving. Like you have a terrible itch, you know if you scratch it, it's going to spread. You're not going to scratch it, which is really hard. And I'm not making up a gross example. That's the example the Buddha used. Um, and the way you renounce desire is not by repressing desire, because that has never worked for anybody ever. The way you let go of desire is by looking all the way through to 10 months after, 10 years after, what's going to happen. And he said that when you think it all the way through, he said this way before Susie did, but Susie Welch um, got it too. Um, if you think it all the way through, that makes things clearer. There's a Harold Pinter play called Betrayal. They made it into a movie. And you see an affair, but it's backwards. So the first scene in the movie is them meeting at the flat that they've rented so they have a place to meet. And they're standing on opposite sides of the kitchen and they're, you know, looking at each other. You can tell the spark is completely gone. Well, should we let the flat go? I don't know. My cousins used it the other day. And they're having a desultory conversation. Um, the second scene is prior to that in the affair. The third scene before that, until at the end of the movie, there's the scene where they meet. She's in her dressing room, brushing her hair. They're having a party. He comes in um, looking for the bathroom, and he sees her, and she sees him in the mirror, and it's like, nah! and. Um, and you just want to go, don't do it. Because <laughs> you've already seen it all the way through. So make an intention to renounce craving by thinking it all the way through, not by suppressing craving, but by just thinking it through. And the Buddha said to his followers, if you think the craving all the way through about what kind of suffering is coming down the road from this decision, then your craving will fall away from you like autumn leaves from a tree. The second one, you intend to have goodwill toward all beings. So he says intention to have goodwill is like a healthy peg that's got to fit a hole in your soul where a rotten peg is right now. And so you make an intention to take the rotten peg out of all the grumbly, resentful um, thoughts that you have, and you hammer in this peg, and the repetitive hammering of this peg is meditation, which we'll talk about in another couple months. You hammer the healthy peg in by just replacing the thoughts of ill will with thoughts of goodwill. It's not easy, and it takes a lot of practice. Um, so you practice for the first intention, letting go of craving. You practice contentment. I'm happy with what I have. I'm in this moment. I'm happy. I'm not going to sit in one situation and wish for another. That's double-mindedness. I'm going to sit in this situation. If I desire to be in another situation, I will change my situation. So contentment, goodwill, and then the last one is non-harming. I intend non-harming. I intend to do no harm. Now, if you're like me, or if you're like most of us, uh, we will paralyze ourselves by trying to parse out exactly what non-harming means and see if we agree with every single level of it before we take the first step. But, my friends, I'm here to say that there is probably much low-hanging fruit in your life where you might have a hint that you're doing some harm and you could maybe stop just that <laughs> and then figure out what the rest of it means. Because for some people, it means I'm going to try not to scream at my sister. And for some people, it means I'm going to try um, to drive better. And for some people, it means that I'm going to um, give up eating anything that is uh, slaughtered in a cruel way. And for some people it means I'm going to eat vegan because that's the most compassionate path that I can think of of non-harming and that's what that means to me. So you don't have to know what it means all the way through. Many people have lots of discussions about what non-harming means. 
but for you, I'm just saying, and by you, I mean me, um, just think of the things that you're doing right now that could be causing harm and try to, to not do those things. Now, by making these intentions, you are setting fixed ropes for yourself to get up the mountain. Um, those of you who know me well know I'm obsessed with people climbing Everest, and so I happen to know that you go on ahead and you or your guides, your leaders, or your Sherpas, who are the best climbers, go on ahead and set fixed ropes wherever they can so that you can clip yourself to the rope and then trudge up the mountain while you still have that rope there because conditions are going to get bad in life or on the mountain. But you have these intentions like your fixed ropes that you clip yourselves to when everything is a whiteout because the snow is blowing and when you're really tired and you can't even tell what's up or down um, and because your brain is starved for oxygen and you can't really even think, um, you're clipped to that intention. You're clipped to that fixed rope that you have fixed in your mind. I am going to get there and these, this is the intention that will get me there. So, you know, you've seen people set intentions um, in the movies. You've seen Scarlett O'Hara in the field digging up a carrot and she's silhouetted against the sunset and she's going, as God is my witness, I'll never be hungry again. And um, that is the setting of an intention <laughs> which shapes her life all the way to the end of the movie. And... You have seen people in, there in your life who have set an intention on, I'm never going to get hurt that way again, and so they just don't ever get close to anyone. Or, I am never going to be around anger ever. My dad was angry all the time, and I can't stand it. And so if you even so much as raise your voice to me, I'm out of here. So you hear, you see the result of people's intentions that they've set. Sometimes they're not even aware of the intention that they've set. But, but people do set those and they do shape a person's life. Uh, Marilyn Monroe's intention, she just said, I just want to be wonderful. I think she did real well for a while there. So to be content, as the Buddha suggests thinking things all the way through, and Susie Welch suggests thinking things all the way through to, to 10 years from now, what's it gonna, what's it gonna be? Um, I already said that part. So, if you have an intention to be content, you practice being content. If you have an intention of goodwill, you practice letting go of resentment. And I've told you about the resentment prayer before that I stole straight from the 12-step program. I had a friend who's in the program, and she told me about the resentment prayer. And she said, and if, um, she said, her sponsor wanted her to pray it for her mother. Well, the prayer involves praying for this other person everything you want in your life that they would have it in their life. And she said, I cannot pray that for my mother. And her sponsor said, why not? She said, I wouldn't mean it. And her sponsor said, that's okay, you don't have to mean it. It works anyway. And my friend said, but that would make me a hypocrite. And her sponsor said, darling, you're a drunk. <laughs> God forbid you should be a hypocrite. <laughs> In Buddhism, it's called the metta or loving kindness meditation. So we're going to practice it at the very end of the service. So if we intend harmlessness, then we practice non-harming. It's just little by little, constant, constant, tiny little decisions. So I just want you to notice what intentions are guiding your life. I want you to think about your compass and what would be on the points of the compass, what words or what concepts are, are you steering by, and are those okay with you? And if they are, great. And if they're not, you might want to try the Buddha's suggestions. And I love that Buddhism never says, you have to believe. They just say, just try it and see if it works. It's like your mission statement. There's one by Rumi that I would like to end with. He writes, be a lamp 
a lifeboat, a ladder. Help someone's soul heal. Walk out of your house like a shepherd. <laughs>